This past week, as we sat around as a group of pastors, we got to talking about the fact that one of the things that we don't expect nearly enough in our churches is life change. The writer and preacher John Ortberg writes in one place about a man in one of his churches. I don't remember the man's name. I'll call him Harry. That seems like a pretty good name. If your name is Harry, my apologies. (laughs) Harry was a member of the church and had been a member of that church for some decades. I don't remember, 30, 35 years. Harry was crotchety, moody, given to a great deal of criticism. And the members had come to expect that. When somebody would come and they would be injured, they would be wounded because of what Harry had said, other members would kind of roll their eyes and shrug their shoulders and say, well, (laughs) that's Harry. That's just Harry. And Ortberg says, it struck me one day that as a church congregation, not just with Harry, but with all of us, we had no expectation of life change. We could be members of that church for 35 years and be just as crotchety and irritable and angry as we had been the day we joined. And it was seen as nothing's really wrong with that. That's just Harry. And we talked this last Tuesday morning about what that means for us as pastors and about what that means for us as a church at Loma Linda. And we agreed We need, as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, to expect to grow. If we don't grow, if we don't become more mature in Christ, let's hang this up and go do something else. A lot of other easier things to do. But if we're going to walk in the blood-stained footsteps of the Nazarene, I hope, I pray, that 35 years from now, I'm not fighting the very same battles I am today. I hope by the grace of Jesus, by the Spirit of His power, that He will have reached into my heart and rearranged the furniture of my life so that I will have grown. That's discipleship. That's becoming more like Him. So I'm delighted with your theme this year. And hope that as you walk away from this camp meeting, you will walk away not just with a program, not just with some good memories, not just with the wonderful music that has been sung, the stories that have been told of service here in the Georgia Cumberland Conference, the passages over which we have lingered, but that you will walk away with a commitment to ask the Spirit of Jesus to make you more like Him. Pray with me. God of grace, it's a challenging thought. Some of us have lived with the specter of legalism in our earlier years, and we rightfully reject that. We don't want to live with a checklist, perfectionistic, legalistic religion. But in our right rejection of that, we have too often thrown out the baby with the bathwater and not realized that as one writer says, the gospel is not opposed to effort. The gospel is opposed to merit. We will never deserve what you give to us. But because you have placed it in our hearts and in our lives, Might we, like the Apostle Paul, stretch and reach and strain for that one thing to which you have called us. With every energy you give us, might we grow as disciples. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So the kids wanted to go to SeaWorld. Seemed like they were always wanting to go to one of those theme parks to which every time I left them, I swore there would be nothing other than the love of my children that would ever drag me back there again. (laughs) 
because somehow the days we went, I don't know if there was a sign that went out, if it was on the newscast, if it was on the internet, but somehow the day I ended up at those places was the same day that every other living soul in Southern California came as well. And we would all be crammed into these spaces, waiting in these long lines. I hate lines. I hate the heat and the bodies and everybody's upset. And I thought, what are we doing here? Daddy, let's go to SeaWorld. Really? <laughs> but the cousins want to go. All right, we'll go. So off we went to SeaWorld. They wanted to see the sights and ride the rides. There was a new ride that year called Journey to Atlantis. I had no idea where Atlantis was, but they seemed to know. So let's go ride Journey to Atlantis. So we got in line. Anita and I were there with Anita's sister, with her two girls, and with our two kids. We slowly made our way up to the entrance. You think it's the entrance. They're very deceptive. You think, I'm right there. We're almost there. We're finally there. About an hour later, you think back and think, I thought that was the, this is the entrance. <laughs> but we finally got up to the place where it says, to ride this ride, you must be, and there is a cutout figure standing there with a hand extended. You must be this tall. The adults were through right away. Austin, our son, he was through. Our daughter Miranda and her cousin Karina, same age, both kind of tall, they were right through. And then came Natalia. And she was trying to stretch and to reach and to feel her head bump up against that hand. And she was just a bit shy. Now, the SeaWorld employee was standing there watching this, watching her make her efforts. He was kind of shaking his head. She wasn't quite there, and he was watching. And my wife and her sister said, just a moment, we'll take care of it. They turned around, and they did some things here, turned around, and suddenly Natalia had, as it were, a little palm tree sprouted out of the top of her head. <laughs> now, I've heard of ponytails. I had heard of palm trees, and she walked up, and boom, that palm tree hit the hand. And that SeaWorld employee just looked and shook his head and said, go ahead. <laughs> and so we were through. We were on. We finally got up to the place where the ride came floating through some kind of a boat, I guess is what it was. And we all got in. And it floated leisurely down that canal until it came to a steep incline. Something jerked and engaged, and up we went. And we got higher and higher and higher. We got all the way to the top, and I'm sure they do this intentionally. We kind of went over, and then it stopped for a minute. Just that last moment when you can review your life and confess your sins. At that moment, just before it tilted, Austin kind of leaned toward me. It, it was scary, I'll confess. He kind of leaned toward me and said, Dad, and I was like, hey, it's every man for himself. <laughs> <laughs> and just as it went over, I heard Natalia behind me screaming as though her life was about to be extinguished. Do you know the thought that flashed through my mind? Should have read the sign. Should have stayed with the sign. Screaming all the way down till we hit the splash and were soaked. Then Natalia was happy. But she had been frightened deeply. Should have read the sign. You ever been at that place where you think, I should have read the sign? Should have read the sign, should have paid attention to the sign, should have noticed what the sign said. Well, somewhere on your discipleship journey, Jesus planted a sign on the pathway. Your time may have come at a camp meeting like this. A preacher made a call, you came forward. Many others did as well may have been in an academy week of prayer, a college weekend of worship, a church service, 
where you responded to the call of God on your life. And you thought about what Jesus offers and that to which he calls you. And you responded, I want to be a part of it. I wonder if you read the sign. Because Jesus had such a moment in his life and ministry. It came at one of those moments, the likes of which we read on our first evening together. One of those moments when his ministry was going well, when excitement was rampant, when people were responding, when everybody wanted to ride the ride. It was at that moment in time that Jesus planted the sign on the pathway of discipleship. It's found in Luke chapter 9. I want to read to you what the sign says. And ask if you have read it. Ask if you are ready for what the sign states. Ask if you are maybe thinking, hmm, I should have read the sign. Luke 9, 23, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. The sign. Planted on the discipleship way. If you would come after me, take up your cross daily and follow me. It's not the kind of sign I want to read. Those aren't the words of Jesus on which I most want to linger. There are others that I find much more deeply appealing. Jesus on the hillside saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. I love those words. Jesus' words to the bedraggled and burdened multitude Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. I love those words. On a night where the moon shadows are deep, as he gazes into the eyes of a righteous religious leader who doesn't have peace in his soul, says to him, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that Whoever believes need not perish, but may have everlasting life. Those are the words on which I hang my destiny. Those are the words I want to see on the sign. I want to enjoy the ride, experience no fear, have the exhilaration of the Spirit of God not only wash over me, but well up within me. That's what I long to experience. But then, pounded like a stake into the ground, stands the sign, whoever would come after me, let them take up their cross daily and follow me. The words are the words of Billy Graham. He writes, when Jesus said, if you are going to follow me, you have to take up a cross, It was the same as saying, come and bring your electric chair with you. Take up the gas chamber and follow me. He did not have a beautiful gold cross in mind, the cross on a church steeple or on the front of your Bible. Jesus had in mind a place of execution. Take up your cross and follow me. But you see, we have domesticated him, or tried. We have taken a Jesus who is gritty and truthful and demanding and dangerous. And we have tried to domesticate him just like the horse on the back 40 gets domesticated so the young kids can ride him. 
We've wanted to domesticate Jesus, take all the danger out of Him, remove the challenge from Him, take the cross away and and overlay it with gold and put it in the front of the church and say, that's what the cross is. Come in and enjoy the joy of Jesus. I'm not against the joy of Jesus, please. But he says, take up the cross, the electric chair, the gas chamber, because this is the way of death to self. And come and follow me. We have tried our best to domesticate him. That's the point of these words. The words are those of Philip Yancey who says about writing one of, for one of his, studying for one of the books he wrote, he says, as I studied the life of Christ, one impression about Jesus struck me more forcefully than any other. We have tamed him. The Jesus I learned about as a child was sweet and inoffensive, the kind of person whose lap you'd want to climb on. Mr. Rogers with a beard. Indeed, Jesus did have qualities of gentleness and compassion that attracted the little children. Mr. Rogers, however, he most assuredly was not. Not even the Romans would have crucified Mr. Rogers. Jesus is dangerous. Make no mistake about it. And he calls us to a life that is not a life of marshmallows and cotton candy. He calls us to a life that includes a rough-hewn cross. And if we would be more like Him, we are called to follow His footsteps. Now, one of the downsides, one of the realities of trying to domesticate Jesus, of trying to tame Him, of trying to take all the demand out of Him, is that we end up living in very small worlds where tempests and teapots become our major challenges. Where no longer are we engaged with the mighty waves that crash onto the shore, but instead we're in the tide pools waiting and looking for little shells. We get caught up in the small realities. We end up, as has often been said, majoring in the minors. That's what happens when we try to domesticate Jesus. An old piece, it's been years ago since it appeared, appeared in Insight Magazine, written by Steve Daly. Some of you will remember Insight Magazine, remember reading it. An old piece appeared in that journal. I want you to hear its words again for some of you. Warm weather, he writes, often brings heated debates in Adventist schools over whether it is appropriate to wear shorts on campus. Recently, I explained my school's position to a student. But as I drove home that evening, I wondered how much of attention this kind of an issue really deserves. My question was answered in a dream that night. I saw students from the high schools, colleges, and universities of Southern California gathered together for a great student congress on the floor of the Los Angeles Coliseum. Each student was instructed to single out the one issue that was attracting the greatest attention on its campus. It was impressive to see the students of UCR erect a huge banner that read, Free South Africa Down with Apartheid. UCLA raised a similar sign with the words, Stop World Hunger. Riverside Poly High School was concerned with overpopulation and pollution. The Claremont Colleges chose as their slogan, End Racist Nationalism, Join the Sanctuary Movement. Fuller Theological Seminary raised the issue of sexism in relation to women's ordination. And USC proudly proclaimed its commitment to ending terrorism and the threat of nuclear war. Then all eyes seemed to focus on the Adventist schools. 
Slowly they elevated a gigantic poster containing the most perplexing message of the day. It was a very simple sign inscribed with the letters S-H-O-R-T-S. Shorts. There was a moment of profound silence. Then a pervasive buzz moved across the floor of the Colosseum. Most of the students seemed embarrassed that they didn't know what the letters stood for, assuming this was certainly an acronym. (laughs) A tremendous debate ensued as students from the various schools attempted to decode its meaning. One co-ed from USC suggested that the letters stood for the shortage of housing in opposition to rising tuition by students. (laughs) But this idea was quickly dismissed People thought it was far too parochial parochial and insignificant in global implications to occupy attention. Suddenly, a UCR student shouted, I've got it! These Christian students have included all of the major issues facing our world today in a single acronym. How could we be so blind? Shorts obviously stands for South Africa, hunger, overpopulation, racism, terrorism war, and sexism. A murmur of approval swept through the crowd, building into thunderous applause. The roar became so deafening that it woke me from my sleep. Then a still small voice whispered, Why are the children of this world wiser in their generation than the children of light? It's what happens when we try to domesticate Jesus. Try to tame him. He said, take up the cross. That's not what he really means. What he really means is come and enjoy a life of uninterrupted success. That's what he means. Doesn't mean a cross. That's a figure of speech. And we domesticate him. When we domesticate Jesus, we lose the reality of not merely the exhilarating life to which he calls us, but the dangerous life to which he invites us. Such was not always so with Adventists. Adventism was born in a crucible of understanding that the world was not always our friend. There would be times when the world would not be our friend. There would be times when the call of Jesus meant the cross of Jesus, meant standing and being counted, being courageous in the face of threat and of disaster. It meant we had to take up the cross and follow Him. But somehow we've domesticated Him, tamed Him, Our kids, when they were growing up, loved the Chronicles of Narnia. Don't know if your kids or grandkids read those. C.S. Lewis's book, books rather, that are written in in a way that captures the imagination of children but have to do with the living of the Christian life. In the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan, the lion, is the Christ figure. I want you to listen to these words from The Silver Chair, where C.S. Lewis draws an analogy with the story of a young girl named Jill. She's in the land of Narnia, and she's thirsty. And then all at once, she sees a beautiful stream and a fearsome, fearsome lion. It's Aslan. Lewis's words, quoting Jill, If I run away, he'll be after me in a moment. And if I go on, I shall run straight into his mouth. Anyway, she couldn't have moved as she had tried, and she couldn't take her eyes off the lion. How long this lasted, she could not be sure. It seemed like hours, and the thirst became so bad, she almost felt she would not mind being eaten by the lion if only she could be sure to get a mouthful of water first. 
Are you not thirsty? Asked the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink. Uh, May I? Could I? Would you mind going away while I do? She asked. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come? She asked. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat, girl, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It did not say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. Well, then I dare not come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh, dear, said Jill, coming a step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred to Jill to disbelieve the lion. No one who had seen his stern face could do that, and her mind suddenly made itself up. It was the worst thing she had ever had to do, but she went straight to the stream, knelt down, and began scooping up the water with her hand. It was the coldest, the most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You didn't need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. Before she tasted it, she had been intending to make a dash away from the lion the moment she had finished. Now she realized that this would be, on the whole, the most dangerous thing of all. For the lion, while being very dangerous, was also very good. Some are uncomfortable with that. But that's the Jesus of the Gospels. Very good and very dangerous. Take up the cross and follow me. We had the privilege some years ago of traveling in Europe as a family with some friends. While we were in Germany, we were offered the opportunity to visit a concentration camp from World War II. See Dr. Blanco here. I'm honored that he's here. We had the opportunity to visit Sachsenhausen. Honestly, I had not heard of Sachsenhausen before. I had heard of some of the others, the Treblinkas, the Auschwitz, the Dachaus. I was not familiar with Sachsenhausen. But we went. It was not one of the big killing places, though many died there, make no mistake. We arrived there and disembarked from the bus and were introduced to our tour guide, a diminutive Jewish woman. She began the tour right away. She was small, but she was mighty. She was filled with the story of her people and what had here transpired. She walked us down the lane leading into that doorway. Those doorways where one thing was promised and another thing was waiting. We walked onto the grounds, acres large, of that camp. And she began to describe to us what had there transpired. She marched us to one part and said this was the place where they lined up for roll call. It was here that they would sometimes stand for hours in the freezing rain or snow, tortured. If anybody broke ranks, if anybody fell, they were taken right over there, she pointed, and there they were executed. And then they were transported to the small crematoria over on the other side of the camp. She took us around what were now placid, peaceful grounds. Very difficult to imagine 
what had here transpired. And then we came to another fence, a fence inside the fence. We moved into a much smaller camp. And inside that fence was what I could best describe as a jailhouse. It was large, made of cinder block concrete. We entered the hallway and looked down that rather long, bare concrete hallway, naked light bulbs hanging by wires from the ceiling. We began to slowly make our way down this hallway, pausing at the cells. Some of the cells had names. Had they been able, if they had been able to determine what prisoners had occupied that cell, there they placed their names. Some of the cells had pictures and stories if they had been able to determine who had occupied that cell. It was while our group made its way down that hallway that we came to a cell that suddenly caught me. I knew that name. I had not known he had been at Sachsenhausen. The name was the name Martin Niemöller. I knew that name, knew a bit about his story. And it was enough to take my breath away and to stand wondering. Niemöller in this cell? Was it here that he penned the words that became so well known after World War II? about his initial tendency to go along with the Nazi machine only to later stand up and cry out that what was happening was wrong. Then he had penned those words. In Germany, they came first for the communists. And I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the Catholics. I didn't speak up because I was Protestant. And then they came for me. And by that time, no one was left to speak up. I wonder, did he pin those words here? I even wondered, could it possibly have been here that the incident occurred? Likely not, but could it have been? The earnest prison chaplain who came visiting prisoners that day, making his way from one cell to another, visiting the prisoners interred by by the Nazi machine. Could it have been in this cell that the chaplain looked through the bars and with a start of surprise said, but Pastor Niemöller, What are you doing in prison? To which Niemöller responded, And you, my dear chaplain, why are you not in prison? Could it have been here? I I was taken in that moment with the things I had read about Niemöller and Bonhoeffer and so many others who had paid a very dear price, including your own Jack Blanco, paid a very dear price for who they were, what they stood for, what they believed. I was taken in that moment. When I kind of came to myself again, I looked around and my, my group was gone. So I quickly made my way down the hallway out onto the grounds of the camp. I couldn't miss this bus. I didn't see my group anywhere. I began to run around the large acreage until finally I found them well over on the other side of the camp. But I had a mission in mind now. I had a specific purpose, a question. I had to wait, to wait until she took a breath and had a break. But at the first possible moment, I went up to that 
little Jewish woman, and I tugged on her sleeve. And I said, I have to ask you a question. She said, yes, what is it? I, I said, I, I don't understand this. We're in a concentration camp. The, the wall around all these acres certainly was not one that could be surmounted. This was not a place from which people could escape. But then inside that wall, there's another wall, another barrier. And inside that, a jailhouse, concrete blocks and iron chains and iron bars. Why did they have Niemöller inside of that cell, inside of that building, inside of that compound, inside of that camp? Why did they have him there? And that little Jewish woman looked up at me and answered as though the answer was as obvious as the day is long, almost with a sense of surprise that I would not know. Why did they have him there, I asked. She looked at me and she said, Oh, because, you see, he was a pastor, so he was a very dangerous man. I've been called a lot of things in my 35 plus years of ministry. I don't recall ever being called dangerous. He was a pastor. He was a Christ follower. He was a disciple. So he was a very dangerous man. Because the regime knew if it was wrong, he spoke. If there were people in danger, he would protect. If there were those who were being decimated, he would heal. If they were trying to shut them up, he would raise his voice like a trumpet. Why? Because apparently he had read the sign. The sign planted in the path of every disciple. If you would be my disciple, take up your cross daily and follow me. There are those times when it feels like we might be teetering on the brink. When I think, huh, I should have read the sign. I should have paid attention. But then I think of Jesus and Peter and James and John and Nemo, and a myriad of others who read the sign. And I say, Jesus, please give me the strength and the courage to pick up the cross and follow you. God of grace, we say we want to be like Him. We sing it. We read it. We study it. We pray it. Lord, help us to read the sign and then give us the courage to follow. In Jesus' name, Amen.